can say? Amen. All God's people can say. Amen. You don't have to say it if I say it like that. But if you want to, it's an invitation. Um, as you've seen, the scripture comes from John chapter 14 today. We are still in the Easter season, that 49, 50 days that takes us from the resurrection to Pentecost, big Pentecost day. Pentecost literally means 50 days, okay? And so before the Holy Spirit comes in the book of Acts, this is that season where we kind of dwell on resurrection. Um, if you've been in here with us, we've been in almost an unofficial theme. We did not theme this as a preaching series, but this question has arisen over and over with us week after week which is how else maybe could the post-resurrection story have gone? Okay, we're all pretty much most of us familiar with how things happen after the empty grave. But starting on that Sunday after Easter, we've been kind of wondering how else might it have gone? Okay, we thought about God's different options for what could be after this huge deed was finally done. Uh, we thought about uh, the possibilities of... Um, Jesus' uh, resurrected appearances. What are some of the ways that Jesus could have appeared on earth and acted in this new resurrected form if he had so chosen? And some of us wanted to see a little bit more nanny nanny boo boo out of that, right? Jesus could have done it. And we talked about the possibilities and why he chose not to and how he kind of came back in the opposite way. Uh, we talked last week about the idea that um, Jesus, that God could have chosen the resurrection to be kind of the ultimate final word in the story of creation. That could have been the greatest possible conclusion to this whole story. But instead of being the last word, God chose for that to be the beginning to a last chapter <coughs> in which we get to live and now live. It's a wild thing to think about. How do we live in this last chapter? Today, we apply the same kind of rationale to the question of what does it look like for us to live an eternal life with God now that Jesus has been raised to life. What does eternal life look like after the resurrection? And that's a tougher thing to wrestle with. We, we ask this question, what else could be? One of the kind of immediate rubs for some of us is, you know, is that not like above my pay grade as a human being to even try to think of an alternative to what God has done? And not only that, but hasn't God done a pretty great job and given us a pretty great story to think that we could somehow improve on it is awfully arrogant. And that is not the goal. We're not here to try to rewrite scripture or change the gospel. Um, but again, starting in week one, we've said we're here to try to hold up some other possibilities alongside what really is so that what really is can maybe stand out with more effect. So we cannot take it for granted. So we can appreciate its uniqueness and its creativity. Because our struggle, agree or disagree, our struggle is that we live on a, in a world where the gospel is the most widely circulated story that has ever been. That's historical fact. The gospel of Christ is the most widely circulated story to ever exist in human history. Okay, we also live in a world where we've had about 20 centuries of Christianity influencing, I would say, almost every culture on every continent on earth. And so it's impossible for us to get perspective on what we might think if it were not for this story. It's impossible for us, maybe in some ways, not to take for granted that we know exactly how the story went. So why not consider together how else it could have gone? It's especially tricky with eternal life because it's a pretty great answer. A lot of us are really familiar with how it goes. You know, God loves us. God is good and loving, just like a good mother or father. God loves us, sent Jesus. Jesus died for us to save us. So now we get to live forever in eternal paradise with God. Yeah? Game over. Okay, or in a paraphrase of John chapter 14, um, Audio Adrenaline Band uh, a few years ago, kind of back in my day, said it this way. God, as far as eternity goes, God has a big, big house with lots and lots of... Come on, somebody lived in that time. Yes? Uh, were you alive in the 90s with me, please? <laughs> with lots and lots of room. A big, big table with lots and lots of... Food. It's implied. Table, food. Okay. A big, big yard where we can play. This is South Carolina. Football. Gosh, y'all. Gamecocks trying to avoid that word right now. What's up? <laughs> we, can play, we can play football. It's a big, big house. It's our father's house. That's a really cool way to summarize John chapter 14's view of eternal life with God now that Jesus is raised to life. Jesus shared those words. He shared these words before his death but intending for us to look back on them to understand 
what is life with God going to look like for eternity after he comes back? Okay? So it's tough to wonder what else could be. But I think we need to in a way because for one thing, the first Christians, early Christians, have always had some alternatives to understanding what else could be. Okay, for the early Christians, for one thing, this is big. Uh, the most mainstream religious system in their day and for many centuries was the Greco-Roman pantheon. Okay, that's like that's an awesome phrase to share with you. Um, Greco-Roman pantheon. You know what I'm talking about. So the pantheon is just the whole collection of gods that you've heard of before, with names like Mars and Jupiter and. <coughs> You can carry on from there. Mercury, Saturn, Venus, Pluto, right? Those really are the Roman gods, and they're based mostly on the Greek gods, like somebody said Zeus and Ares and Aphrodite and all these other folks. So you've heard of them sometime or another, um, I promise, and maybe you've heard of some of their stories. Why is that important for us? Because we need to understand that this whole collection of gods and God experiences and God eternities that were at hand for early Christians. Uh, because God was a newcomer, this version of God, Jesus, was a newcomer to them and was kind of like the underdog in a world of all kinds of other stuff when he first unfolded the story that is so bland and vanilla and normal to us. Okay, you with me? Okay, so just to give you a sense of how they might have perceived eternity, um, I don't even want to, I'll, I'll be honest, I looked up this week several stories and and. and pieces of Greek myths and stuff about their gods, and there's very little that I can share with you on Sunday morning in a family-friendly way, because it is crazy. It is crazy, crazy, crazy. I will tell you to Google it. You can do that. Just be careful, because if you want to learn about the gods, so Zeus, we've heard of, yes, Zeus was like the king of the gods. Zeus, for instance, uh, was a wild character. Most of his time, most of his stories centered around the fact that he loved to visit the earth, and he had a particular... Uh, attraction to mortal women. And that's all I'm going to leave you with. And you can imagine all the different ways that that story goes. Zeus likes to take on different forms according to the stories, and it was a wild time. As it was said, the Greeks used to think that about 30% of the population was sired by Zeus. Okay, so you probably had some kind of godly heritage if you believe that stuff. Uh, my point is, it was the soap opera of soap operas, the stories of the gods. Um, even Zeus's birth, people would say it's not Zeus's fault. Zeus's dad was pretty screwed up. Um, so Zeus's dad's name was Kronos. Okay, maybe that sounds familiar to you. And Kronos gave birth, according to legend, to most of the big gods and titans and massive powers of the universe. The problem was Kronos was concerned that his children might try to get together to overthrow him. So what are you going to do as a dad? But he ate them. He ate his children. Awesome. Sorry, children. Um, Zeus only survived, was one of the few survivors, because his mom gave Kronos a rock dressed up as a baby. So the story goes. I'm just trying to give you an example of what folks in that world were dealing with in the form of their gods. And we know that their dealings with humans were even worse beyond just the Zeus lady problems. Uh, we know that Prometheus, who tried to give us fire as human beings, was punished to an eternity of growing a new liver and then having vultures eat his liver every single day, only to grow a new liver the next day. I'm sorry, this is borderline family friendly for you maybe anyway, but I gotta, I'm trying to paint you the picture of alternatives, okay? If we go too deep into that, you're gonna see that for our Christian people in the early world who were coming across the gospel, it was revolutionary. It was mind blowing <laughs> to think that God could be good at all. That is a crazy concept that we take for so much granted that was not true at all in those days. That God could be good, that God could be trustworthy. Most of the time, the gods came to earth to mess with humans because it was like humans said, man, if I was a god, what would I do? And that became the story. And they messed and they messed and they messed. And eternal life was usually a trick. It was usually an eternity of punishment. It was usually an eternity of nonsense. So I just wanted to set the stage before we go to John chapter 14 to try to hear how else some of this could have gone. Um, as I talked to Smoke this week, um, he confirmed, we, we just talked about the fact that this would have blown people's minds. And it needs to just maybe start to do that for us as we try to get some perspective. Uh, this is Jesus talking again. He's describing eternal life 
after his resurrection, he says to his disciples in the upper room before his crucifixion, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. <clears throat> Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. I actually want to stop there in verse 7. If you want to read the whole passage, please do that. But our focus for today stops there. In chapter, our verse 7. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. And you've heard it before. Maybe. John 14. John 14, 6. Probably. Uh, most of us have heard pieces of, of this passage. It's part of the United Methodist uh, service for funerals. You will oftentimes hear this passage described in many rooms in Christ's preparation for us. I wanted to start with all that Zeus and Kronos nonsense, just maybe again, to hear how different the promise of Christ is. It's one thing for a God to come to earth. That happened in that world in different stories. It's a whole other thing for that God to come and to be forgiving and to be one of us, and to teach, to try to help and to heal, to use his God powers for our sake in that world, there was no reason for a God to stoop so lowly because what could we do for a God that the God would do that for us? It made no sense at all, let alone for Jesus to continue, for this God who's come to earth to continue to break bread and to eat with his disciples and then say, hey, I'm fixing to die for you, an excruciating death so that you can be free. And the result is that we get a chance to be together forever, okay? got to start to wrestle with that a little bit. The first thing, the first huge promise that we hear right here is that this God has come to earth and said, there is room in my own house for you in eternity. My house. And I will prepare the place for you. That's crazy stuff. God's have better things to do. You know, if you imagine heaven rightly, it's probably we deserve. God's got a big sweet palace in the very middle and a big throne. And maybe we get to live on the outskirts, like in the boonies of heaven, in little shacks. And maybe the better you were in life, the holier you were, the better your mansion. Uh, maybe the worse you were, you're out there with me, just way out, way out. Okay? That's what, what would make sense. But Jesus says, in my Father's house, it implies we get to live there and we have room there. It's crazy. And it's not just because it kind of is big and empty and why don't y'all just kind of move in on the back wing somewhere. There's plenty of space. It shouldn't go to waste. It's I made it for you. It's prepared by me for you. It's crazy stuff. It's crazy to think that that would be. It should have been blowing people's minds that it needs to do more to blow ours. That God would want us to share his house. Crazy stuff. It's the opposite in many ways to this idea in the ancient world of the gods who were separate and distant and high and mighty and above. And where did the Greek gods live? Do you know? It's pretty easy, I think. Okay, so Mount Olympus, this idea that there's a mountain that extends into the clouds where the gods are above the fray. And this is the opposite of the story. Okay? Second big thing we hear in John chapter 14 is that this God who has come to earth and is going to die for us is going to bring us to the house that he's prepared for us. Going to bring us there and help us get there. It's a crazy thing to think about. Not only is he going to prepare space, that's awesome, and we get to have awesome room, and it's time together in a house home forever. Not only is God going to make us a home, but he's going to help us get there in the first place. Why is that mind-blowing? Because, again, in the ancient world, even in the more modern world, usually the gods would make you earn every inch of everything you had. Okay, so we could go to like, pretty famous right now, uh, Norse, Norse mythology. So we're talking about Odin and uh, Marvel fans, little boys in the back. The guy with the hammer, what's up? Thor. Thor, okay, Odin and Thor and Freya and all those folks. So in those myths, guess how you get to heaven? 
There is no God going to say, hey, let me bring you up here. You get to heaven by dying a good death. So for Vikings, that meant, what, what do you think a good death looked like for our Viking friends? Is this like falling asleep in your bed when you're 95 like it is for us? Is this a good death for an American today? 99 years old, dying in your sleep, no pain, rock and roll, right? What do you think it looked like for Vikings? It could not look any more opposite. You want to die in battle. Ultimately, you want to die with your sword in your hand. It's a bad day if you die without your sword in your hand. Ideally, your sword is covered in freshly slewed blood. Straight up, sorry, family friendly. It's the way it is. Ideally, you have taken as many of your enemy down with you as possible, and you yelled the entire time, and you were half naked, and it was a crazy old time as a Viking person. Because if you did so, then you have earned your entrance into the Hall of Valhalla. Okay? And I don't want to just pick on pagan stuff. If we go to our foundation with the Hebrews and the Jews, there's an awful lot there that taken wrongly sounds like you better do a lot of good stuff and achieve a lot of spiritual feats and do everything just right if you want to somehow get through the velvet rope that is heaven. Amen? And the early Christians were real familiar with all of the above. And instead, Jesus says, not only am I going to make a prepared place for you with room, I will bring you there myself. I will die to pave the way and bring you back with me through death into life. It's crazy stuff. It needs to blow our minds a little bit. It's the last really cool thing in John chapter 14. Not only do we have space, do we have room, not only will Jesus bring us to that space, but having brought us there, Jesus promises to transform us so that we can enjoy that space. And that's not very explicit in John chapter 14, but to me, when Jesus says, no one's coming to the Father except through me, it's describing the way that we get to enter heaven through Christ, which means, according to elsewhere in Scripture, we get to put on Christ, which means we can be acceptable to God and we can be transformed. Why is that a big deal? This is really unique to Christianity. Why is that a big deal? Because would you want to spend forever with you in your current state? Agree or disagree? Yes or no? This is not rhetorical. <coughs> Would you want to spend forever with yourself in your current state? Please say your answer out loud. You can say yes if you want to. We'll talk about how cool you must be to want to do that. Because I couldn't tolerate myself for 100 years in heaven if I was like this. Couldn't, couldn't do it. I wouldn't enjoy it. I wouldn't be fit to be in God's presence. I wouldn't be any good to the people around me who would all be perfect and transformed and I would be me. Okay? I'm not trying to downgrade how you see yourself. I'm talking about the fallen part of our nature that has no business in eternity. How awesome is it? This is a key ingredient to heaven being worth anything. That we come through Christ so that we are new people and transformed when we get there. That will make it worth being there. And it will be awesome. Because again, there are too many legends and other versions of this story where, sure, you get to have some kind of afterlife, but it is usually just a repeat of what this was. Just one more time. And maybe another repeat. Maybe forever. But it's not a lot different from what's going on here. Our faith is one of the only, if not the only ones, that promises a transformation that's going to make eternity worthwhile. Amen? And it's crazy to think about. And if you hear, God is doing a lot of work in this equation. We're basically doing nothing. Except he says, believe me. Believe me. Believe me. Trust in me, Scripture says. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, because I am your way and your truth and your life. Awesome. It's just, we can't beat it. Um, we need to do what we can to, to not take for granted even passages that we know so well. It's really hard. We need to do what we can to put ourselves in the shoes of early Christians, even people around the world today who are faced with some really rough alternative versions of eternity. I'm not trying to downplay other groups of faith and other systems of belief. We just, we have an offer here that is uh, incredible and hard to pass up. 
And I can't think of an alternative that is worth living. Amen? Uh, and the invitation here is to you and to me, from Jesus to each of us. So let us pray. Holy One, the way that you move can be uh, mind-boggling and amazing. And we trust that, that is the way it should be if you really are God. We appreciate that your gospel doesn't sound like something that humans wrote for themselves. We appreciate that this doesn't just sound like a soap opera that acts out our deepest human desires or makes entertaining stories about your way. But rather, it is clear, it's clear to me, pray it's clear to us that no human hand could have concocted this story. Now, we frankly cannot imagine for ourselves a better alternative to your gospel. Lord, we can admit that we do get used to it, and it's awfully familiar to us. Sometimes we've concluded that you just have to be the way you are, that you just have to do for us the things that you promise us. But we know that just like a good mama, you have chosen to because you were God that you never had to do any of this. The story did not have to go the way that it has gone. Please help us to, to understand it. We're here to try to respond to you, to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.